Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this I'm going to talk about the dynamic type in C Sharp. I'm going to explain what it is and how it works. We're going to take a look at the history of why it was introduced in the first place. We're going to take a look at some benchmarks and some really, really weird stuff from the past. And ultimately, I'm going to explain why it has no place in my code in 2021, my C Sharp code. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and ring the sub notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So let's go straight into the code. And I have four projects here. I'm going to start with the explanation just to make sure everybody's on the same page with what dynamic is. Because some people starting with C Sharp now actually do not know about this feature. And that's good. But I think it's worth knowing about something that exists in the language you're using just to know why you shouldn't use it. I'm going to open the explanation program and what I have here is a main uh, method and I have something that says get calculator and returns a dynamic type. So a calculator is a calculator, it can add, subtract, multiply and divide. So what you can do is you can say uh, dynamic calculator equals uh, get calculator which is dynamic we don't know exactly what's going on there and then if i do calculator dot i don't see anything about this dynamic type this dynamic type is truly a dynamic type something like a language like python or um, javascript or ruby would be uh, those languages do have IntelliSense because those types can be traversed and you can actually see what's in there but there is no compile time checking. I can type anything here and the compiler will just say, yeah, that's good, I like it. And then when the time comes to actually execute this piece of code, it will throw a runtime exception because it could not find it. And during runtime, it will do all those same compile time checks, but during runtime. Now, this to you might look very weird because C Sharp is a statically typed language meaning that during compile time if something doesn't exist you will know about it and you're gonna get a big fat red exception but the dynamic type goes around all that check and says yeah that that but the thing that you just typed that's fine let's see how it works in practice right so what i want to do is get a result and i want to add two numbers so let's just assume that there is an add method and i'm gonna say 10 here and I'm going to say 20 here. Also, ultimately, I want to add and get a result of 30. And I'm going to say the result was 30. So if I execute this piece of code now in my console, I should see, yes, the result was 30. Now let's do the same with subtract or multiply. So let's multiply those two numbers and it should be 200. So if I execute that, so I see an exception, and the exception is that the uh, it's a runtime binder exception, and it says that it does not contain definition for multiply. And sure enough, if I go to the calculator class, you will see that it only has an add method. There is no multiply. So that's, in essence, the idea behind dynamic. The fact that you can have dynamic elements, like elements from dynamic languages, in your c -sharp code, but why, right? Why would you do that? Um, and, and by the way, before I answer the why, um, you can't new up a dynamic object. So I can't just say equals new dynamic. But what you can do is you can use the expander uh, object uh, class, which behind the scenes is storing that into a dictionary. So then you can say things like uh, example.name equals Nick. And you can say the name was example dot. The reason why you see name here is because um, Rider identified that this is a property that I used above and it shows it, but it's not coming from C Sharp. C Sharp IntelliSense doesn't really know about that. So if I was to execute that, um, it will say the name was Nick. So why, right? Well, you have to remember when Dynamic was introduced in the language. Back in, in April of 2020, 10, uh, C Sharp 4 was introduced and C Sharp 4 had this feature with it and also something called DLR, Dynamic Language Runtime. At the time, C Sharp was very much a Windows specific language running in the .NET framework and it needed to talk 
in an efficient and elegant way to other stuff as well. Now, why that was a requirement, I don't know, especially the, the weird stuff that you're going to see in a second, but there was a need for something called COM interoperability. Uh, I won't explain a lot what COM is, but let's say you want to talk to the Office um, API, Office Automation API. It was very hard to do in a clean way in C-Sharp. Well, Dynamic was making that very, very easy. I'm going to add a link in the description uh, from a talk from Anders uh, Hensberg when he originally talked about this feature and all the use cases around it. I think it's worth a watch, just so you know the history of the of the language and the feature. But it was a time where I don't know if C Sharp had an identity crisis or if it was Silverlight uh, that Microsoft was trying to push at the time that caused all that uh, mayhem. Um, but what do I mean by identity crisis, right? Well, I want to go to this weird labeled project and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a package called iron python now if you don't know what iron python is congratulations you're lucky but you might also be surprised with this so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say uh, calculator dot pi so a python file and I'm going to write this class now so we're gonna say class calculator and we're going to have a static method here. And I'm going to say definition add x and y and return x plus y. So this is a Python uh, class. Now, you don't need to know Python, but remember this is a different time where C Sharp needed to do this type of thing. And what I can do is I can say dynamic Python equals Python dot create runtime dot use file and I will say calculator.py and I know this is weird let me just quickly mark this file as copy always and content so it gets transferred into the build folder and now let's just take a calculator right calculator equals python.calculator and what I can do is I can say just sum equals calculator.add and I can say 50 plus 10 and console.write line, the result from Python was sum. And if I run this code, some of you might be surprised, some of you might not, it will actually load the Python file. And with dynamic, since Python is the dynamic language, you can actually use it in C sharp code as if it was C sharp. Some of you might think that's cool. It is, but there isn't a justification to actually use that. Now, that's besides the point. There was a time where this Iron Python and Iron Ruby were thought of things that you could use um, in C Sharp and it was fine to use them. But obviously, this is not a requirement that you have seen anymore going around. Like, there isn't really a reason for you to do that. But this was one of the reasons why Dynamic was introduced. I won't show common interoperability just because we're dealing with um, .NET 5 Plus, which can run in many runtimes. Um, so let's leave that outside of that. But that's the reasoning behind it. Now, my first introduction to the dynamic keyword was with the view bag in uh, MVC. And view bag is a, is a property in the view which you can access and just put a property in and get it out in your view. Now, what struck me when I first used that, and that was like five years ago, and I didn't have any idea about all of that was that it made me feel way less safe like why wouldn't i just use the model it's mvc model view controller why not have that as part of the model but i was seeing this part in all over the place and i was using it myself but i knew something was wrong and as i was going and as dotnet was evolving i was seeing it less and less and less and ultimately i follow a simple rule when it comes down to dynamic Always use generics over object if you can, and always use object over dynamic. And if you follow these two rules, it means you don't really have a reason to use dynamic. You know, I don't want to do any of that Python stuff. Like I don't have the use case. I don't need common interoperability. I don't have those requirements that it was originally envisioned to satisfy. So I don't have a reason to use it. And probably you shouldn't either. Introducing a dynamic element in a statically typed language makes you feel unsafe. It's the same thing as refactoring code without having unit tests. I'm 
really scared I'm gonna break something and I want to know about it until it's too late during runtime. Now, that being said, I'm going to show you some benchmarks just to build on top of um, what I already talked about, uh, which is dynamic isn't really unsafe just because it doesn't have any compile time checking. It's also unsafe because it's slow and it does many, many calls to imitate the compiler during runtime. Um, actually, if I showed you IL code, you would see that, um, let me use the IL viewer. You, you will see, for example, that this simple code is way more elaborate than just, you know, as you can see, this is all the compiler services that Dynamic is using to return the name field. A lot more calls and a lot of more compiler service and runtime binding and call site. I mean, it has caching, but ultimately it's not something fast. And we can quickly see that by running these benchmarks. Um, if I go to the program and I, and I run these benchmarks and while they're running, I can show you what the benchmarks are. Um, I introduced two values, a dynamic um, value dynamic based on the user type and then a user type directly. And then I'm trying to get the name property out of them in a dynamic and a statically typed fashion. And then I'm also doing that in a 10,000 item scale um, just to get an idea on how the feature scales. Uh, we can go to the run and wait for this to complete. And once this is done, let's see how dynamic compares to the statically typed alternative. So the results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, the dynamic version is significantly slower and actually the significantly more memory allocation and garbage collection in the 10,000 scale. So it's not just that it's unsafe, it's also way more expensive. So if you care about performance, you should not be using dynamic and ultimately if you care about reliable code, you also shouldn't use dynamic. With that out of the way, and with all that said, I'm going to talk about the one use case where I think it's fine to use dynamic. And that is during rapid prototyping when integrating with an external API. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to go to uh, my use case folder here, and I already have JSON Newton soft installed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the GitHub API and try to get one of the values from that response um, and that will be the let's say the follower account on my github account so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say var new http client equals new http client and i'm going to add some headers because the the uh, github api requires that and then i'm going to say var response text equals uh, HTTP client dot get string async and I need to turn this into uh, an async task because I want to await it. Here we go. And then the uh, address is HTTPS uh, API dot GitHub dot com slash users slash alpha crash. Yep. And then we can say dynamic response equals uh, resp uh, JSON convert dot deserialize object and then response text and I need to await this and now this dynamic now can allow me to access any property in that response I'm going to show you what the response looks like um, and all I want to get is the followers so I'm going to say right line uh, nix uh, github followers are and then the number which is response dot I don't have IntelliSense obviously but I know that it's called followers. And since it's a contract, at least for prototyping, this will do. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And as you can see, it gets my accurate number of followers. And I didn't have to create a POCO object and then map to that for properties that I don't need. And this really helps me, especially with JSON APIs, which if you work with them, they're very, very much more complex when it comes to the contract and rightfully so. It makes it very, very easy for you to integrate with those APIs without needing to build complicated pockets behind the scenes. For example, the automated thing I have for Patreon, which whenever you become a Patreon, you can use a website and get invited to my GitHub repo, is using Dynamic because the contracts from Patreon and uh, GitHub are a bit more elaborate and I don't want to just sit down and make POCO objects for every single one of them. So what I do instead is I just use Dynamic and since they are contracts, which means they don't 
change unless they get versioned, I'm safe to just use it. But this is code that nobody will see other than me, and it's not gonna go anywhere near any scenario that needs to be high performance. I'm getting one of those requests like every day or so, so it doesn't really matter. And it is a flexible way to go about it, but of course, it's up to you to say, okay, this is now something that needs to go to production. Let's build a POC object behind it, serialize that into a proper CLR object and push that in prod because we need that performance. We need that memory. We need to be safer. That's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.